Alchemy is dead. Long live alchemy. Many of the sciences we know today, like medicine or mathematics, have been around for a long time, and they have evolved into their current shape. New knowledge and technology open new frontiers and change the way we understand things. Professions like architecture and engineering evolve too, from the construction of pyramids to cathedrals to modern bridges. But chemistry was different. Its predecessor, alchemy, had been around for many centuries. But rather than seeing an evolution from alchemy to modern chemistry, somewhere in the period between the late 1700s and the early 1800s, alchemy became discredited and died away, while the new science of chemistry emerged almost from scratch. How did this happen? And why? Well, join me in this video where we will find out who killed alchemy. Chemistry is everywhere. It explains our world. It underpins most of the other sciences. It is even present in our nightmares from school. Chemistry provides us with medicine, food, fuels, clothes, materials, drinking water, batteries, and much more. But it wasn't always this way. The origins go back to Egypt, when priests were preparing mummies for the afterlife. The names alchemy and chemistry can be traced back to Kimi and Kemet, which were names used for the Black Earth in Upper Egypt and the Valley of the Nile. Without knowing, humans had been doing chemistry over the centuries, manipulating and combining metals to make weapons, jewelry, etc. By the time we reached the 16th century, even with contributions from India, China, and the Arabs, alchemy had become an obscure and secret practice that had two main objectives. To convert lead into gold, and to find a fountain of eternal youth. It's funny, because even in the Enlightenment, the secret practice of alchemy was still very much alive. You would be surprised to hear that Isaac Newton, whom we would definitely consider an enlightened man, well, he was an enthusiastic alchemist as well. But then it all changed. By the early 19th century, alchemy was dead, and the new science of chemistry had taken its place. I will argue that there were three men who were responsible for this. Let me introduce them to you. Number one, Humphrey Davy. From antiquity, there were several chemical elements that were known to humans. Copper, gold, silver, iron, lead, tin, antimony, sulfur, and mercury. Over time, other elements were added to the list, like zinc and phosphorus. But there was much more to be discovered yet. Davy was born in Cornwall, in England. We give him credit for using electricity to discover new chemical elements. He built a large battery, or pill, where he performed, first of all, electrolysis of pure water, demonstrating how it could be separated into hydrogen and oxygen with the help of electricity. Then he turned his attention to molten salts. He started with potash. And when he applied electricity, he was able to decompose the material and separate a new metal, which he called potassium. He then used the same technique with caustic soda, and he separated another metal, which he called sodium. No one had seen materials like these before. Sodium and potassium were definitely metals. They were malleable and conducted electricity very well. Both products looked silvery and were very soft, but they were incredibly reactive. With an electric current, they would give an intense light and even create a column of flame. The pieces of metal sometimes exploded violently, breaking into smaller pieces. I mean, I remember when I was at university how a professor took a tiny piece of sodium and dropped it into a glass of water. Cutting the sodium felt like slicing butter with a knife. As soon as the sodium touched the water, it created a bang. It fizzled crazily on the surface for a few seconds and then disappeared in the solution. He did the same experiment with potassium, and we got a bigger bang and a quicker fizzle. Sodium and potassium are actually very common. Just think of the salt in the sea. But they are also so reactive that we never find them in their elemental state. They are always combined with other things, forming hydroxides or salts. We have them inside our bodies, and we drink them in electrolytes to keep hydrated. But back to Davy. After he isolated sodium and potassium, he went on to work with other minerals, including lime and magnesium. Just in the year 1808, he isolated four more elements, calcium, magnesium, strontium, and barium, and later on became the first to isolate boron, and he confirmed the existence of chlorine. As a side note, deciding who discovers an element is not always straightforward. Sometimes one person observes or predicts an element, but another one isolates it. I won't be too strict about these definitions in this video, but you get the idea. Davy was not just a chemist, he was also a philosopher and a poet, a true polymath. He was the mentor of Michael Faraday, who went on to study electromagnetism. We have electric motors and generators today, thanks to him. Davy even received the Volta Prize, awarded by Napoleon in 1807, 
which is remarkable considering that France and England were at war during that time. This is an example when scientific achievement and politics are separated. That was Davy. Number two, Lavoisier. Antoine Lavoisier was French, and many consider him to be the father of modern chemistry. He made many contributions. First, he helped with the understanding of water. You see, water was a mystery. Aristotle considered it to be one of the four components that made our world, together with earth, wind, and fire. But water presented a problem. It may look like a consistent material, but while some waters were pure, clean, and drinkable, others were fetid and poisonous. As a young man, by measuring the densities of different types of water, Lavoisier proved that what looked like different waters was actually water mixed with different things. It sounds simple today, but it was a revelation at the time. Lavoisier also identified the importance of the element oxygen. He saw that when we burn something into a gas, the weight of the gas plus the residue will be heavier than the original sample before burning. He also noted that when metals corroded, they became slightly heavier. This got him thinking that when something burns or corrodes, it must be absorbing something from the air. At about that time, Lavoisier had communicated with Carl Schiele in Sweden and with Joseph Priestley in England, both of whom had performed reactions that produced oxygen. We can credit Schiele and Priestley for that discovery, but it was Lavoisier who understood the centrality of this element in all of nature. Oxygen is highly reactive and it is present everywhere, not only in water, but combined with most other elements in the form of oxides and ores. We also know it is necessary for combustion. Oxygen plays a vital role in life. Think of respiration, photosynthesis, the oxygen they give us when we are recovering at the hospital. But oxygen also is present in the decay of things. It reminds us of the shiny metal that turns to rust, the apple that oxidizes as soon as we bite it, the trees today that will be tomorrow's carbon dioxide. Oxidation is one of the forces with which the world is constantly changing. Once Lavoisier understood oxygen, he went back to an earlier experiment where Henry Cavendish had separated hydrogen. Lavoisier built an apparatus with two gas chambers, one with hydrogen and one with oxygen, both connecting to a glass bulb in the middle. He added the gases and ignited the hydrogen. What do you think happened? He created water! You can still see the original apparatus on display in Paris. It is easy to understate the importance of this discovery. Again, just think of the prominence of water in our planet, from the deepest oceans to the clouds in the sky, and what it means for all of life in between. And we're not done yet. Lavoisier wrote his elementary treatise on chemistry, which launched a revolution in the education on the subject, thrusting a mortal stab to alchemy and disposing of obsolete concepts like the phlogiston. He confirmed that mass remains constant even when it changes shape. For example, a piece of ice will weigh the same after it becomes a liquid or a gas. He produced the first modern catalogue of substances and established the way we call chemicals today. He introduced the idea of calling compounds by their composition rather than by their appearance, as alchemists used to do. For example, if a compound came from copper and sulfur, it became copper sulfate, not vitriol of Venus. He gave hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen their current names. Ironically, however, he got oxygen wrong. You see, Lavoisier thought that all acids contained oxygen, so he called it oxygen, creator of acids. But it was a few years later when Davy confirmed that although many acids contain oxygen, the key element in acids is hydrogen, not oxygen. As we know now, some acids, such as hydrogen chloride, they contain no oxygen. A final note on our friend Lavoisier. He was French. He was noble. In addition to being a scientist, he had also been a tax collector before the French Revolution and he was sympathetic to the French monarchy. He died in the guillotine during the terror in 1794. This is an example when scientific achievement and politics are not separated. When Lavoisier died, his friend and mathematician Lagrange said, it took them but a moment to cut off that head, but France may not produce another head like it in a century. And we need to give credit to his wife, Marie de Lavoisier, because after his death, she published all his writings and translated his treatise into English. All right. Number three, Berzelius. No list of great chemists can be complete without including the Swedish John Jakob Berzelius. He inherited a legacy of scientific inquiry from Sweden, from Charles Linnaeus, the taxonomist, to Carl Schiele, who had discovered several elements before him. Berzelius trained as a physician, but he turned to chemistry because he wanted to understand the secret of life. He was intrigued with the effects of electric currents in the body. This was a common interest during that time. We know Davy was doing it. Victor Frankenstein was doing it too. 
Berzelius' biggest contributions were in inorganic chemistry. When you think of a modern chemistry laboratory today, with its rubber tubes and paper filters, well, all of those were improvements introduced by Berzelius. Next time you hear the words protein or catalyst, remember that it was him who used those terms for the first time. Berzelius gave chemistry a solid quantitative foundation by doing two things. First, he advanced the work of John Dalton, related to understanding the proportions in which elements and their compounds combine with one another. At the same time, he came up with modern chemical symbols. Yes, the ones you remember from the periodic table <laughs> and the nightmares from school. Then he put both concepts together. Once you have simple symbols for the elements and you know in which proportions they mix together, what do you have now? Well, chemical formulas and more nightmares. Some people love them and some people hate them. Today we take them for granted, but in 1811 they were a revelation. Symbols, proportions, formulas, now you're not far from balancing equations and having more nightmares. And there's more. Berzelius' system allowed chemists to eliminate the distinction between materials that came from nature and those that could be made in the laboratory. Take any compound, say ammonia. Looking at the symbol, we can tell it contains fixed proportions of nitrogen and hydrogen. Ammonia is ammonia, whether it is made synthetically or it's produced inside of our body. And to top all of this, Berzelius discovered four chemical elements, cerium, thorium, selenium, and silicon. Fun fact, just like uranium was named after a planet and a Roman god, and much later neptunium and plutonium were too, cerium was named after Ceres, which was a Roman goddess. And it was also considered to be a planet at the time. Today we know Ceres is not a planet, but an asteroid. Ceres was the Roman goddess of agriculture and the harvest the Latin version of the Greek goddess Demeter. Ceres is where the name Cereal comes from. So now you know, three great men. They discovered many new elements. They developed new ways to do experiments. They made enormous contributions to chemistry so it could emerge as a full-blown science. If anything, the purpose of this video is to make you aware of who Davy, Lavoisier, and Berzelius were. I hope you can feel, like me, admiration for their work, their intelligence, and ingenuity. But let's go back to the original question. Who killed alchemy? Well, these three men probably did. But there's a different way to look at this, by understanding a fundamental difference between chemistry and alchemy. Chemistry embraced open debate, an exchange of ideas, and the use of the scientific method, which crucially includes the feature of reproducibility. According to the scientific method, my discovery cannot be fully proven until you can reproduce it independently with the same results. Alchemy, on the other hand, was pursued in secret. I mean, if you discover a way to convert other metals into gold, you don't want to go and tell everybody else how to do it, would you? The writer David Wooten explains that even as people like Newton were making incredible advances in scientific understanding, in mathematics and physics and optics, Newton himself kept quiet about his work in alchemy, warning his friend Robert Boyle to keep high silence. Alchemists would not share or reproduce the experiments of others, but neither could they learn from previous mistakes. As Tim Harford points out, if Newton could famously say, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. As an alchemist, he stood on nobody's shoulders and saw little. So what really killed alchemy was the open nature of the scientific method. That was the real coffin. Lavoisier, Davy, Berzelius, and others. Well, they put the lid and the nails on top. By the way, most of the references I make in this video come from two books. The first one is Periodic Tales, The Curious Lives of the Elements by Hugh Aldersey Williams, which goes into a wonderful exploration of most of the elements in the periodic table, telling the story of where they came from, who invented them, etc. The other book is Tim Harford's How to Make the World Add Up. I'll put links to both books in the description below. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Watch this space because I'll be covering similar topics in future episodes. In the meantime, you can check some of my other videos, leave your comments, click like, subscribe, whatever you want, and see you next time.